Um, so it's uh, on uh, DSA and ECDSA, so it's uh, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. So if everyone, if anyone wanted to be in a different session, it's still time to escape. Um, <laughs> otherwise, welcome. Uh, it's an awesome session. It's a very important algorithm. So it's uh, maybe maybe the most important session at the conference because it's what both the security of TLS and the, the security of all our Bitcoin um, relies on. So with uh, uh, so um, just to introduce myself, so I'm Mark Fulweis, so the session chair, and uh, with no further ado, I give the floor to uh, Daniel uh, Gankins from uh, UPenn and UMD. Hi, Mike. Okay, thank you for the introduction. My name is Daniel Genkin, and the title is ECDSA Key Extraction for Mobile Devices via Non-Intrusive Physical Side Channels. And this is joint work with Lev Pachmanov, Itamar Pipman, Elan Tromer, and Yuval Yarom. Okay. So side channel analysis, especially physical side channel analysis, is the dark art of extracting crypto keys by measuring unintentional non-physical leakage from computing, uh, from computing hardware. And we usually run these attacks on what I refer to as small devices, SIM cards, smart cards, FPGAs, small microcontrollers. And what all of these devices have in common is that they're quite slow and simple. It's basically one chip that does crypto every time we ask it to. It doesn't have a lot of components. It runs very slowly compared to PCs around 100 megahertz. These devices are, uh, use quite a, quite a lot, uh, doesn't use a lot of energy, and they're highly mobile. You have one in your credit card, and you have one inside your phone, in your SIM card, and wherever you go, you carry these devices on your body, and they go with you. Now, in terms of non-intrusive side channels, well, here's another example where we have a card reader augmented with a power probe. And by monitoring the card's power consumption, the, we are able to deduce the secret key hidden inside the card. So all an attacker has to do is to wait patiently for someone to plug in his card into the malicious card reader. Now, we've gone pretty good at this. We have 20 years of research on the, about these attacks, uh, thousands of papers, hundreds of different approaches. And only recently, we've started exploring a, a completely different category of targets. And this is what I call big devices, laptops, desktops, server computers. And when it comes to side channel analysis, in many aspects, these devices are the quite opposite. First of all, they're very fast and very complex. They run multi-gigahertz CPUs, often more than one CPU, billions of transistors, thousands of discrete components. They use quite a, quite a bit of energy, and they're rel relatively static. And only recently we began to explore uh, the side channel vulnerability of these targets. And here's an example of a device around that big, small enough to fit inside a pita bread, where if you bring this anywhere near your laptop, it will measure the electromagnetic radiation coming, in, uh, coming out of the laptop and steal your crypto keys. In this case, it's an example of where your lunch is eating you. Now, between these two, I argue that we are missing an entire category of targets. And this is what I call mobile devices. Uh, tablets, phones, tablets, smartphones. And when it comes to side channel analysis, these devices are the worst of both worlds. First of all, they're very fast and very complex. It's the same CPUs that we were putting in our laptops a few years ago, we're now putting in our pockets as smartphones. And from the other side, they, use, they don't use a lot of energy because we're optimizing for battery life, and they're highly mobile, we carry them on our body. And very little is known about side channels in this regime. So that's the question we ask ourselves. How vulnerable are mobile devices to non-intrusive side channel analysis? And can we attack such a device cheaply, non-intrusively, and surreptitiously? So let me quickly go over our results. We were able to attack these devices using the two classical side channels, the power analysis and the electromagnetic channel. And we've exploited these channels by coming up with uh, low, uh, uh, low bandwidth cryptoanalytic techniques. And what's nifty about our techniques is that we only need around 100 kilohertz of analog bandwidth in order to achieve key extraction from a, from a phone running at one gigahertz. So that means that our measurement speed, 100 kilohertz, is five order, orders of magnitude less than the target's execution speed, and yet we are recovering keys. Moreover, these things are non-adaptive chosen ciphertext. We only passively monitor the target's leakage and extract keys. And because the bandwidth is so low, we only need around $50 of equipment, very scientific equipment, in order to get keys out. 
Now, this is applicable to many real world ECDSA implementations, in particular various versions of OpenSSL, Apple's Common Crypto, Core Bitcoin, which is used in many Bitcoin clients, and on many hardware devices, both Android and iOS devices. And in no case did we modify the device before attacking it. And hopefully, assuming the demo gods will be with me, we'll see some of these things today. So let me start by, say, by showing how a low, leakage, a low bandwidth uh, leakage of a mobile device might look like. And we're going to be monitoring EM radiation coming, in from, coming out of a phone. And well, for that, obviously, we need a phone. But then we need something to pick up the electromagnetic radiation. And this is a, an antenna. It's basically a coil. And this would be picking up radiation coming out of the phone. Now, we need something to convert this analog information coming out from the antenna to digital information. And sound cards are are, will be very happy to digitize whatever analog information is present on their input port, usually from a microphone, in our case, from a coil. And they would be very happy to take that in, amplify it, digitize it at relatively good quality. So what we'll be doing is we connect our coil to a state of the, a, a, a run of the mill sound card. And the sound card produces digital information, which we uh, connect to US by via USB to an attacker's laptop that will analyze the information and show it on the screen. Now, in terms of equipment costs, well, the sound card, we got it used on eBay for $50, very scientific. And the coil, well, you, you need a loop antenna. And the simple way of doing it is take a piece of wire and make a loop out of it. But that won't produce a nice picture. So what we did instead is we went on eBay and we got a professionally wounded up coil that produces a nice picture. It cost us $2, including shipping costs. So overall, $52 of equipment to mount the attack. And let's see what we get. So let's hope that the demo guards are with me. Yes. Come on. Oh. So this diagram is called a spectrogram. It's a way of monitoring leakage signals. It's a, very, it's a visualization uh, tool. In this uh, spectrogram, the time axis is the vertical axis. Time goes up. The horizontal axis is the frequency axis. And signal intensity is given off in yellow color. In this case, there's no stray signal so far, but we'll see what happens. Now, I have my trusty iPhone right here. And what I'm about to do is place it on this coil that I've prepared beforehand. So let's see what we get. So immediately, you see that the screen became much, much brighter. And this is a good indication that the coil is now picking up whatever the phone is radiating. And if I ask the phone to do something for us, well, we immediately have some structure. Let's find a good place to stop it. Here. So what do we have here? Well, there is some structure. There is some symmetry. But it's more even, even more subtle than this. This area right here, this yellow area right here, looks very similar to this yellow area here. And vice versa, this area here with this break in the middle, looks very similar to this area here. So there is not just the structure here, there is repetition. So what's going on? Well, what I asked the phone to do is one second loops of multiplication instructions, and then one second loops of additions. And here, immediately, you see another one second loop of multiplication instructions again. And here's another one second loop of additions. So just by $50 of in equipment, a crappy sound card and an improvised coil, I am able to deduce something about what the phone is doing. So I hope that this convinces you that there is something to be observed here. Something can be picked up. And if you're still not convinced, well, here's a nicer recording. One minute. Here's a nicer recording that I made in the lab. And you see additions here, multiplication operations here, and again, additions and multiplications. OK. Now, while there is something to be measured here, we are not in the business of deducing coarse information about phone's activity. We care about stealing crypto keys, more specifically ECDSA keys. So let's steal some crypto keys. Now, let's look how a low bandwidth leakage of ECDSA might look like. And before that, I need to establish some notation. So ECDSA stands for Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. And well, it has elliptic curves in it, so I must talk a bit about elliptic curves. Well, an elliptic curve is defined by the equation y squared equals x to the third plus ax plus, a plus b, where a and b are known as the curve parameters. If we plot this, it looks something like this. A point p is, uh, of x and y is said to be on the curve if x and y satisfies the curve equation. 
And that's all I'm going to say about elliptic curves, except that because we have signature, we have a digital signature, then the signature and, and verification algorithms are defined as follows. So ECDSA is obviously a public key crypto system, and we have the, uh, the secret key and the public key, or the verification key. The secret key is consists of just a Scala ID, it's just an integer. And the verification key, or public key, consists of a group generator uh, G, and then another elliptic curve point, which is the result of taking uh, the Scala ID and multiplying it with the generator. So what, do, what does this mean? So we have here an operation that takes as input an integer, and a curve point, returns a curve point, and the assumption is that given the result of D cross G and given G, it is hard to recover D. It's as hard as completed the discrete logarithm over the elliptic curve group. Okay, so that's the hardness assumption. And let's see how from that we can build a, a signature scheme. So how to sign a message? Let's say we have a message M, we hash it, we get the digest E, we truncate the digest to the N most significant bits, we get what's called, as, what we will define as Z, we then generate a random scalar K, which would be the nonce. We compute, again, this special scalar by point multiplication. We compute K cross G. We've got the result point P. We then set R to be P dot X, the X coordinate of P. We compute S to be this ugly expression here, K to the minus 1 times Z plus RD. This is S. In case R or S, any of them is 0, we abort, we, we, and we try again. Otherwise, the signature is defined to be R comma S. That's the signing operation. We also have the verification operation, which contains no secret information because everybody should be able to verify a signature, contains no secret keys, nothing for us to steal, therefore I'm gonna ignore it for now. Not interesting. Okay, so we want to steal a secret key. What's the secret key? Secret key is D. So where does D come into play here? Well, here's D. So one natural approach would be, let's try to attack this multiplication operation and get D out of here. The problem is that this is not a scalar by point operation. This is a multiplication of two integers. And this is very, very, very fast. Although these are two big integers, it's still very, very fast to, multipl uh, to multiply them. And in particular, so fast that there is little hope of, for us, measuring at 100 kilohertz against a device running at one, at one, one gigahertz, to even see anything about this multiplication. So, on the, so this is unfortunate. The only place where the secret key is used, to us, it's leakage free. I cannot get anything from there. As far as I'm concerned, this is leakage free. So what else can I do? Well, the nice part, again, for me as an attacker, nice part, is that ECDSA is very, very vulnerable to even partial information leakage about its nonce. In particular, if K is somehow leaked, then recovering D is easy. Well, you have S, take S times K, it cancels out this one, so we have S times K equals Z plus RD. Subtract S, divide by D, so yeah, divide by R, you're left with D. So revealing K is a disaster. Should not ever happen, should not ever leak. And moreover, as we'll see, even partial information about K, very partial information, would be enough to break the signature scheme. Okay, so let's proceed to key extraction. Now, what we're gonna attack is this scalar by point multiplication, which is the only thing that is slow enough for me to actually measure. So for that, I need to, to discuss how this thing is implemented. So first, data structures. Well, the integer k is represented in what's called known as non-adjacent form, i.e. NAF form. So it's similar to the usual way we represent an integer, which is just bits, and then the number is b equals two to the i times bi. But we also allow for uh, digits which are 0, 1, and minus 1. So for example, representing 7, we can represent it as 0 and 3 ones, or as 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Why do we do that? Well, it helps a bit on performance, because uh, this, if we allow this representation, we can decrease the number of non-zero digits in a random integer from around 1 half to around 1 third. Non-zero digits are more expensive performance-wise than zero digits, so it gains us something. So that's known as NAF representation. The W NAF representation is generalization to base W. In this case, we just allow uh, digits, uh, odd digits in the range of minus two to the W plus one, all the way to two to the W minus one, or zero digits. Okay, so that's W NAF. Let's see how the scalar by point operation is actually implemented. So the input to this algorithm is a scalar K represented in the W NAF form, so we assume that KH minus one all the way to K zero are its digits and a point P. 
it produces what's known as k cross p, the scalar by point multiplication of k and p. So the first thing that this algorithm does, and I won't analyze this code because it's too ugly, it computes a pre-computation table q, and the invariant is that in the highest location of q, q qi, is the same as taking i as an integer and computing cross product with p. So q of i is i cross p. Given that this is the invariant of the table q, let's see how the algorithm proceeds. So first we take the accumulator and we set it to be the value of if h in the k h minus one location. Well, recall the invariant I just said, q of k h minus one is the same as k h minus one times p, and that's exactly what a holds. Now, trust me for the next uh, 30 seconds that, they, that in the i situation of the loop, it would be the case that a, the accumulator, is k h minus one all the way to k i cross p. And let's assume for a minute this is true and see how the, the algorithm proceeds. What it does next is it takes a and, multi and doubles it. Doubling uh, a, a, a point of this form is the same as appending zero in the end of, this, of the scalar. So we get that a is kh minus one all the way to ki plus one with zero in the end cross p. And now we have two options. If ki happens to be zero, we're done. You already have what we want. If not, then we go to qki, we fetch from the ki's location. What did we fetch? We, fake, we fetched ki cross p. And then we add it to the accumulator, and this results in any case after this if of a uh, being a, a k to h minus one all the way to ki cross p, and in particular in the last iteration being k cross p. So that's w naf scalar by point multiplication. So what's, let's cryptoanalyze this. What is going on? What can we learn from here? So first of all, we have these two operations, double and add, and these are computationally heavy. It's an ugly formula. Moreover, these are two ugly formulas, one for double, one for add, completely different formulas. And if you happen to see a side channel leakage co corresponding to a double and corresponding to an add, it's very easy to distinguish the two. So this alone reveals information about the location of the zero digits of k. Why? If we see a double followed by an add, then this ki was not zero. And we, if we see a double followed by a double, then the uh, ki was zero. So we can deduce by looking at the double add sequence or DA sequence of this algorithm, we can deduce the location of the zero digits of K in NAF representation. Unfortunately, it stops there. We will never be able to recover the exact value of the digit other than the fact that it is not zero. And on the looks of it, we're stuck because, well, we know something, but we don't know everything. But again, the nice part about ECDSA is that we don't need to. Knowing the zero digits of the nonce is enough to break the scheme. Okay, so let's see it live and hope that the demo gods will be with me again. So I've just asked the phone to perform a lot of ECDSA operations. It's basically continually signing the ECDSA. And we see here this dashed line that is appearing. Each of these dashes, these vertical dashes, is a leakage from an ECDSA operation. And if I were to take a whole pile of these dashes, the, the resulting signal, and demodulate it, the say at its amplitude demodulation, the same thing that your radio does when it's re receiving an AM station, well, I would get something that looks like this. This is super ugly, I agree, and very little people, not a lot of people can find anything here. But already, uh, this looks similar to this guy, right? It's more dense, and in between there is something. So once we perform some fancy signal processing, we get the graph on the, on, uh, below. So what do we have here? Double, 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 and add. A few more doubles, another add, another, another chain of doubles, add. A long chain of doubles, rudely interrupted by the operating system that decided that this talk is not important enough. It needs to do something else right now. A, a, another chain of doubles and add, a few more doubles, another add, and it keeps on going. Now, this reveals the DA sequence, or almost out of it, except the interrupt. And after collecting the DA sequence from 5,000 signatures, we, uh, we build the lattice basis, then we apply the SVP solver, uh, shortest vector problem solver, to the lattice, we recover the shortest vector. This problem is hard in theory, often easy in practice enough for us to do. And we recover the key. So what did we have overall in terms of measurement time? Every, every signature takes 0.1 of a second on this phone. 
overall for 5,000 signatures, 500 seconds, about 10 minutes of measurement time, and about $50 in equipment. Recovers, as I said, Bitcoin keys, for example. Works on various versions of OpenSSL, Apple's common crypto core Bitcoin used by many Bitcoin clients. And I encourage you to try this at home. Some of the vendors, after we've contacted them using responsible disclosure, actually bother deploying countermeasures. Others ignored us, saying it's outside our threat model. So some vendors still are still doing this. So please do try that at home. Now, in terms of attack scenarios, well, here's an example. We have a glass desk, a phone placed on the desk, a coil glued underneath the desk, and the attacker's equipment somewhere below the desk. This is a, produce, produced a nice picture for you to see everything. But in a real attack scenario, we won't be using a fancy glass desk. We'll be using a wooden desk, a, a coil hidden inside the desk, this thing hidden away, and just place your phone and you're done. Place phone here. Well, here's another example. This is using power analysis. We have a phone connected to a cable, connected to a battery pack, which acts as a charger. And in between, we have a tap that monitors the uh, power consumption used by the phone. And with the same measurement equipment, we are able to extract keys this way. This is something to think about on your way home, pl plugging in your phone to your favorite adversarially controlled charging station. Works. OK. So briefly about countermeasures, and with that I'll conclude. Why did this work? Well, it worked because we were attacking, uh, we were learning information about the nonce, and from that, using lattices, deducing information about the secret key. So one natural approach would be to secret share the nonce into n nonces using additive secret sharing, compute ki cross p separately, and then combine the result into k cross p. That is a valid countermeasure, because what happens here is in order to deduce that, is, is that something is a zero in k, I need to, it to be a zero in all ki's from one to n. So it, my life is harder. I need to collect more signatures. Of course, performance now drops, because previously we were computing one uh, k cross p, which was hard enough. Now we're computing n of them. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is what's called nonce blinding, where you compute k plus cn cross p, where c is a random multiple, and, uh, th and then you compute this cross p. k plus cn, everything cross p. Now this works because it uh, messes up the locations of the zero digits in k because it's hidden by this random, uh, random multiple of n. Looks fine, looks a bit better, but again performance drops. Because now k is a big number. You, multi, you took a random multiple of n and added it to into it. So you, the, bit, uh, the bits of k grew. And again, performance drops. Now, a third way of defeating this kind of business is to use better algorithms. In particular, Montgomery ladder. That's the algorithm that was carefully designed not to reveal, at least not in the coarse way, information about the, uh, the values of k. And I argue that you should be using this if you care about resi resistance in the wild and not WNAFs. Now, it's not only about the algorithm. It's also about implementations. Even the best of algorithms will be brought down by a stupid implementation that leaks information. So I hope that this talk convinced you that you should uh, spend the performance and the time and, human, uh, and the human power to uh, invest in careful, constant time, constant cache implementations. And if you don't do these things, then I have coils and sound cards, and hopefully many others will have them, and we're coming. Okay, thank you, and I will take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, please ask questions. We have time. Hello. Um, Isaac Chef Cornell, uh, I think it was a great talk, and I just want to ask, uh, suppose I buy uh, your equipment and I am running your, your algorithms and I want to steal somebody's cryptographic keys, how do I induce them to sign something with the same key 5,000 times in a row? So there are a few ways of, of, of doing that. Here's just one example, which is micropayments. I am providing Wi-Fi at very cheap below market value rates for what that product is. But you're going to be paying me, I don't know, one cent a kilobyte, some, 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 something like reasonable, or if not, then one Satoshi a kilobyte. The problem is that for that, you need to sign 
everything is JVL Satoshi, by the time you've downloaded your movie on my super speed internet connection, you already signed enough uh, for me to run the attack. So that's just one example. Okay, more questions? So, um, yeah, uh, hi. Hey, Dan. Uh, great mm. talk as usual. Um, I'm just wondering about the, like, the SVP solver part of this. Like, you, you said that like, you were able to solve SVP and you kind of swept it under the rug, which I understand, but can you go into a little more detail about like, why this particular instance of SVP is, is solvable? So, is, ECDS in general, if you, you're, if you have leakage on the nonce, you can construct a lattice where, for reasons that we don't know why, but LLL works. It just works well in practice. So, so you use LLL, but the, the point here is that the LLL gives you a short enough vector. Yeah, and the short enough vector, its second coordinate will contain the secret key. I can prove this. It's a mathematical statement. Mm -hmm. And like you, you, you run LLL, you get a short vector, look at the second coordinate key, the key is written there. It, uh, that's it. And like there, there is an entire proof in, I think it's Nuyan and Sparlinsky, that, that says that, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you used like, like other um, lattice basis reduction algorithms, would the same property hold? Or? Yeah, the, 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 lattice, the, the property so is the property of, of the lattice. The, pro the property of the lattice. LLL is just the best and fanciest hammer to, to, to reduce lattices. If you can do it by hand, it will still be there. Just a bit, we won't be seeing you in a while because you're reducing bases. Okay. Thank you. So if instead of 50, you're willing to spend 100 or 500 thousand dollars at what point does uh, resistance become futile at what Sorry? point at what point at what point in terms of cost to the attacker you'd say well i can't protect a phone uh, if the attacker is willing to invest that much money so it's not only about money it's about scenarios and i i, I, I believe that's that's a more uh, that's that's a, the, the 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 more uh, right for evaluation because if you're the nsa and you have enough money then you can buy everything you want. What starts limiting you is not the fact that, uh, that you don't have enough money to buying is the equipment, is that the signal coming in from the phone, assuming case intrusion is out of the, out of the question, because if, if I come to you and start taking your phone, phone apart, you punch me in the head and run away. Assuming we, we, we don't allow case intrusion, then you start being limited by the signals coming in through the case. And these are nasty. Running attacks with the case closed is hard. And, we w and even if you have all the fanciest equipment in the world, if the case filters out all the good signals, it won't help you. What you should be investing in is not in, in, in fancy toys, is in human anal uh, analyst time, in trying to get more out of uh, the signals that you already have with the sound card. It is specifically for, for, for common phones. And in particular, the reason why we need 5,000 signatures is because we were three people or four people writing the paper, and we did not have a brigade of engineers. In a perfect world where you can recover the entire DA sequence, we heard a paper today that reduces it down to four signatures. So that's the room for improvement would be. Uh, quick question, uh, Cesar from Tampere. Mm -hmm. um, why do they use uh, WNAF uh, if the, I mean, uh, Montgomery Leather has been for some time, do you know? I do not know. And moreover, when we told them, please use Montgomery Ladder, they told us that this attack is not practical, it doesn't exist, and hardware attacks are outside the fault model. Some of the things are still there. I don't know. Okay, there's time for one more question. Uh, while the next speaker, I think, is setting up. Also, we have time. I don't want to start also too early because maybe some people want to switch uh, sessions. Um, I'm Moon Givni from Korea. Um, um, if you use the traditional terms used in power analysis, then your work seems to be a kind of simple power analysis which dis uh, distinguishes uh, addition from yep. doubling, right? Then yeah. did you use any other techniques such as differential power analysis or correlation power analysis? Okay, so fair point. Uh, Differential and correlation and all of these fancier techniques, they assume under the rug that you have a lot of traces and you can average them. 
And that works well. It, it improves the signal, except one caveat. It assumes that the secret, in this case, whatever you're measuring, which is the nonce, is the same in every invocation of the crypto primitive. That's why you can get a lot of traces and you can average them out. In the case of ECDSA, that's not gonna fly because ECDSA, every time you invoke the primitive, you get a fresh randomness, fresh nonce, fresh leakage, and if you average it out with the previous one, you got nothing. You destroyed, the, the only thing that you had, you already destroyed it. What, you sh what we did instead, so now we are stuck with like one trace, and moreover, the sample rate is so, is so slow that we cannot even do horizontal things to, to measure out the noise between samples. What we ended up doing is cleaning up the single trace we have using spectral time, uh, time frequency tricks. That's the only thing we could do. So I don't know if it, this is simple power analysis or a different analysis just because we're using time domain analysis. But DPA is out of the question and all of these side channel literature that let's average out traces, throw that out of the literature as well. ECDSA was, has a nice feature of side channel resistance in this manner. So let's thank the speaker again.